the stress that comes to preparing for us is not a joke. I feel like I've missed my wife so much. I've missed my kids so much. So now I know I'm more stable because I passed my husky. You need to learn how I remember uh, palm to palm, palm to door, some <laughs> those things, you know, how to dress good. If you come here with your spouse at the early stages, because husky is what determines your stability. Mm -hmm. When In today's video, we're going to share with you how to bring your family to the UK. Apparently, you may be a nurse in here and you've got a family back home, whether in Nigeria, Ghana, or wherever, and you are thinking of bringing them in here. This video is going to show you the process, the step-by-step -step process you have to take to be able to accomplish this task. One important thing I want you to know is that I've got a special person in here who has gone through the process, every bit of it, and is willing to share with us the experience. So if you think this video will give you much, much value, then why don't you come with us to explore the processes involved in bringing your family to the UK? Welcome back. If you are new to my channel or if this is your first time seeing my channel, my name is Sesda Kumajima. You can simply call me Kobe. Um, as I already mentioned, we're going to talk about how to bring your family to the UK. We're going to show you the step-by-step -step process. I haven't done the process before. I've got a special person who has gone through the process and is willing to share his experience with us. So without wasting much time, I'll give him the platform to introduce himself. As I said, I'm not fit to introduce this man. He's my big boss. And then um, we can start from there. So my big boss, you know, please, the ball is in your court. <laughs> Thank you very much, Said You're welcome. Uh, you are not the, the big boss. I've always <laughs> told you that. I yeah. want to be like you when I grow up. Yeah, my big boss. <laughs> I, I think uh, Seth is, is a great man. He's very humble and very hardworking. Thank he's you. dedicated and he's uh, passionate about about things. And that is one of the reasons why I admire him so much. Thank he's you, my boss. And he's a master <laughs> what he does. Yes, yeah, so uh, my name is Gideon. So my full name, I have a very long name. My full name is Gideon Abangwin Alale Aku. And uh, you can just call me Gideon. So if you go to Facebook or YouTube or wherever, that is the name I use everywhere. All the four names. But if you just search for Gideon Alale or Gideon Abangwin, I think you should pop up somewhere. So uh, I'm a nurse, like he said. I was a nurse back home in Ghana. And uh, I happened to find myself in the UK here. And I still work as a nurse. Uh, yeah, so hopefully we'll be able to do justice to the topic. Let me some board here. Thank you very much for having me. All right, you are welcome. I'm really pleased to have you on my channel. Apparently, today is the first time, and I'm very happy. And I believe that the topic I'm going to talk about today will be much more valuable to anyone watching this video. And the one thing I forgot to say is that he's a colleague YouTuber. You know, um, I'll leave his YouTube channel link in the description but just subscribe to his channel he shares valuable content that i think will go a long way to help you so please subscribe okay you can pause this video and then check in the description box subscribe to his channel and then you can come back and then continue okay so thank um, you very much thank you <laughs> yeah okay um let's dive into the topic for today so you're going to look at how to bring your family to the uk I know that when you get the chance to come to the UK, most of the employers would want you to come alone. Um, at a point, you may have a family, a wife back home, you have your children back home, and um, the reason is that they would want you to come in here, settle, and at a point, bring your family to join you. Most people have asked me the procedures involved, and I felt like I've not done this before. Why don't I search for somebody who has gone through the process and uh, get him on my channel to share his experience? So that is why you see my boss on here, Kideon, coming in over to share his experience. I'm going to ask some few questions and then um, based on that, I believe that um, whatever questions you've asked me will be answered in this video. So um, Gideon, uh, my first question I'll ask is, um, let's say I'm a nurse in the UK, I've had a chance to come in here to work. Apparently, I've worked for like a year and two and I feel like I'm much more stable. I can bring my family to join me. Let's say I've, I've got my wife back home and I want to bring my wife to join me in here. What's the first step I have to take? All right. Thank you very much. So uh, I think I want to start the process from when you are back home in your country, whether you are in Ghana or you are in the Gambia or you are in Nigeria or wherever you are. I think I'm going to use mine as a case study. So the time I had the opportunity to come to the UK, I was newly married. In fact, we were married for barely six months. So we're talking about 
leaving your newly wedded wife behind and going to a country you've never been to and staying there alone. Many people would have regarded six months after marriage and still within the honeymoon period. But of course, we had to take a new step to see how we can better our lives. So when this opportunity came, we started thinking about how can we probably move so that we can have a reunion at least in the near future. So as part of my interview, the interviewer was kind enough to ask me whether I was married. Of course, I'm wearing my wedding ring, so uh, it's easier for people to detect if I'm married or not. So they asked the question, I said, yes, I was married. And then they were asking about whether my spouse would like to join me. I said, that is actually what our aim is. So they told me that, well, because of so many factors, I am not able to come with my wife because uh, settling in, you know, trying to put things in order, it will take time, it will require a lot of financial commitment. So I need to go first, then get things ready before my spouse will come. It didn't make sense to me at that time because all I wanted was to move with my wife straight away. We didn't have any kids, off, obviously. Uh, so it was when I got to the UK that I realized that it made a lot of sense because if you come here with your spouse at the early stages, there is a lot of things that you may go through that will not be very pleasant. But if you are alone, you are able to get the opportunity to get used to the system, to organize yourself. Because first of all, when you come, the accommodation they are going to rent for you is going to be just for one person. You cannot sleep in that accommodation with another person. And also, when you come, remember you are moving into a new country. And if you look at the value of the currency back home, and the value of the pound is just so insignificant. So no matter what amount of money you bring with you, when you come here, it is not enough to be able to rent a bedroom that will be able to accommodate you and your spouse or probably your family if you have children already. So it is only proper for you to come here, first of all, and then make the preparation. So to answer your question directly, the first step you need to take in order to bring your spouse is to pass your OSCE exam. Because OSCE is what determines your stability. Mm. When you come here, before your OSCE, it means you do not have a PIN. You need to pass your OSCE and be guaranteed that you will have your PIN in at least 30 days' time. And until you get your PIN, you will be working as a band 2 or a band 3. And the salary within this range is nothing to write home about. It cannot support a family. So you need to first of all get your PIN. And to get your PIN, you must pass your OSCE. Then, when you pass your OSCE, you have to start thinking about how to get your accommodation ready to prepare for the coming of your partner or your family. Um, that's very good. I mean, it's much more insightful. OSCE first, because, I mean, OSCE determines your stability. I mean, I like that, yeah. You, you've got only three attempts to go, and let's say you've fallen for all these three attempts. What happens? You say that you are going back home or, I mean, so you bring your wife with you and then eventually not passing your OSCE. Psychologically, I think it won't really be of much benefit to you. So the first step is to pass your OSCE, that's great. What are some of the factors that may cause the employer to say, we want you to come along, leave your wife or your children back home so that you bring them in later. Mm -hmm. I know you mentioned some of them, but I just want us to be specific on here. This, that, that, and then. All right. Thank you very much. I think I already did mention that one of the reasons is because uh, at that time you are not financially stable. Yeah. In order, I think it depends mostly on the kind of contract they are going to give you. Mm. In some trust, the contract is such a way that when you arrive in the country, they will give you a thousand pounds free money. Mm. Or some will give it to you as an interest free loan. And others will still be prepared to give you up to three months of accommodation before you even start work. So it means that you will be in their accommodation for the first three months when you arrive in the country. So what that means is that you will not use your own money within those three months to pay for accommodation. Mm. So you will be able to gather enough money within that period so that by the time probably your spouse comes, you'll be able to get an accommodation of your own that can accommodate both of you. But I think the most important element here is that although your company or the hospital that you are going to be working with appreciates the fact that you need to come with your family, remember 
you are the key person that they are employing. And because they are not sure whether you'll be able to pass your OSCE within those three attempts, it's very, very important to many hospitals. Because what that means is that if you do not pass your OSCE within the first three attempts, it means that they may not be able to keep you in the country. Because if you are applying for your visa, as part of your certificate of sponsorship, there is a, a contract. And if you read it carefully, it will be indicated there that your visa depends on your passing of the OSCE. So your visa may suffer if you are able to pass your OSCE in your third attempt. Mm -hmm. So that would be a loss on the part of the trust. It means they have invested money in you, not only brought you yourself, but they have brought your family as well. And now you have not passed your exam and you have to probably go back home and then come back later and try again. That would be a loss on the part of the, the trust or the hospital that you are coming to work with. So I think the hospitals are always playing safe. They want to be sure that when you come alone, you'll be able to pass the exam. And one more thing, when you come with a family, say if you already have a wife and kids, or I prefer to call them children, you have a wife and children, they may serve as a form of distraction, directly or indirectly. Yeah. Excuse me to say this. I know that family, we love our family, we love our children, and we want to be around them. But honestly, settling in the NHS, it is not a joke. Yeah. Because this is a time you are now getting used to working 12 hours a day. You are getting used to running hectic shifts. Even there are days you don't even know how to be able to manage your time well. And you have to combine that with preparing for OSCE. Of yeah. course, you and I prepare for OSCE. Yeah. So you understand yeah. exactly what I mean. <laughs> you need to be yeah, able you to... You know the stress practice. situation is, I mean, yeah. Exactly. The stress that comes to preparing <laughs> for OSCE is not a joke. You need to learn how, I remember, uh, palm to palm, palm to those, of those things, you know, how to dress good. So you need to rehearse all these... <laughs> how to oh, rehearse good, yeah. all these things. Mm -hmm. You need a lot of time to be able to prepare yeah and then write the oski so if you have your family around you your chances of failing is higher than your chances of passing awesome. so i think it is in the wisdom of the trust or the hospital that you're going to be working with that they allow you to come alone so that when you clear the first hurdle if you pass the oski or oh, they know that you have done yeah. 80 percent of the work what is just left is for your pin to come so what is not left is how to be able to manage your stress after work. And that does not affect your family life so much. So you'll be able to manage that very well. So I think those are the reasons why most trusts prefer you come alone because of the financial commitments, because of the distraction your family may pose to you, and because you need time to be able to concentrate to pass your OSCE. And I also think that the kind of contract they offer you also yeah, determines yeah, whether or not your family will come immediately or not. Thank you very much. Okay, so the kind of contract they offer you has a part to play, your OSCE preparation has a part to play. And I also think the main objective here is to pass your OSCE because as you said, it's, just, it's what gives you stability in the UK. If you have not passed your OSCE, I remember the last time someone sent me a message and said, she's been in the UK and then um, I think last week or last two weeks was her last OSCE test she was going to write. So her fate is like, is still hanging in the balance. She's written twice, no success, and then she's got one last more chance to go. Which means OSCE first, and then you can think of the next process. So now what's the next process? Let's say I've passed my OSCE, I've stayed in here for like one year, and I feel like I've missed my wife so much. I've missed my kids so much. So now I know I'm more stable because I've passed my OSCE. So what's the second step to follow? All right. Thank you very much. I think you don't even need to wait up to a year or two before you can bring your spouse. Mm. I think my wife came here in record three months. When I got here, it was in the third month. Third that month. My wife had to join me because, yeah, you, you know, like yeah, I said, when... you are past Oski. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. So, luckily, we wrote our Oski in our second month. Yeah. And then my wife came the following month. So, oh. it was more like everything went. went very fast, fast okay. so you don't necessarily need to wait for up to a year or two depending on how things go for you mm. so there are simply five steps that i've outlined 
that you need to pass through to be able to bring your spouse along here. And uh, I think it may vary slightly depending on the country you find yourself. Mm. But for most people who are coming from Ghana, where I came from, will be able to pass through these simple steps to bring their spouses along. The first thing you need to do is to go to the gov.uk website. That's the official website for the UK government. You go there and go to the UK VI. That is the UK uh, visa immigration. Yeah. Yes, they have their website. You go there and just search for the types of visas. Mm. You will see a column for dependence visa or okay. spousal visa. That's how they have captured it, either dependence or spousal visa. Then you just start the application process. So when you start the application process, you need to fill in all the details of your spouse. Mm. There are some of the places you need to fill in your own details, and there are places you need to fill in the details of your spouse. When you are done with that, look out for the requirements, the requirements that your spouse needs to get in order to be able to fill the form effectively. Then you tick all the boxes and provide all the details that they need. When you are done with that, so, um, let, me, uh, let, me, let me interfere with this a little bit. So can you tell yeah. us what are some of the requirements that one needs to, right. get to be able to say, okay, I mean, I'm up and ready for it. Yes. So I'll, I'll talk about the documentation, but I've, I've kept that one at the bottom part. Okay, now I'll, I'll get part. back to that All side. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So the first one is to go to the UKVI website and then go to fill the form, the spousal visa, and you look for the individual requirements. Then you go and do a police clearance certificate. You need to do a police clearance to indicate that you do not have any criminal record. That is your spouse. Because as they are entering into another country, the UK visa immigration requires that if your spouse has lived in any country within a period of 10 years, they should provide a certificate from the police to indicate that they do not have any criminal record with them. Okay. So you obviously need to get a police clearance. It's not very expensive, so you can go through it. Then after the police clearance, you need to be able to get your TB test done. You need to book and get your TB test. This is also a requirement that people who are entering of, the UK. That's on the part of your spouse. Exactly. So, so your spouse needs to get the TB test done as well. Then after the TB test has been done, uh, you also need to book a day to go and do your visa biometrics. Mm. So that's a fee point. So you need to book a day to go and do the visa biometrics. I'm not quite sure if... It is still only a moving pick hotel that they do the visa biometrics, but those days it was the moving pick hotel that you can go and have your biometrics done. So uh, talking about the documentation or the requirements that you need to be able to fill the form. So the day you are going to be doing the biometrics, okay. that same day you need to provide supporting documents for your application. And one thing I must specify is that they may not tell you all the requirements that you need to provide. You will have to provide additional documentations to support your claim. So like the more documents you present, the more points you get, and the higher your chances of getting the visa. Okay. You can get your, my wife, my wife had a visa in record one week. Within a week, her visa was ready. Oh, wow. So depending on the, the, the kind of documents you present, if you present, very accurate documents and they are exactly what they are looking for there's not going to be any delay so first of all you the spouse who is already in the uk you need to provide your residential address where you are staying your postcode you need to state your job one. okay yes your postcode all the details that are indicated there L luckily the time my wife was applying our uh, certificate of sponsorship had not expired yet okay. so i attached the number of the certificate of sponsorship to the application and then we attached our marriage certificate very very important the certificate of sponsorship is it compulsory so let's say if 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 let's say someone's owner has expired um does it mean that it's going to affect the visa application no. or is it just a way no. to Say that, okay, I mean, yeah, yeah just to support. Exactly. You know, like I said, there's a proverb that too much meat does not spoil the soup. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that if your 
certificate of scholarship has expired, you cannot get a visa. You will definitely get a visa. But just that, of course, is just to give the visa officers or the immigration officers more details. Okay. That you are, you the spouse, you are already in their country. And this is why you are in their country and you are there legally. Yeah. And you want your spouse to come and join you. So it's just like giving extra information. So um, after providing your residential address, your postcode, uh, you also need to provide your marriage certificate, like I said. Is that, is that one then, compulsory? Like, is it is it compulsory? Or you can just so ignore... So a marriage certificate, a marriage certificate is compulsory, okay. I must say. Because the only reason why the person is coming to join you is because you are married hmm. or you have a legal partnership and the legal partnership you also need to produce documentation to indicate that you are really married apart from that there is no proof again to indicate that you are really married so in this case many people are tempted to send their church marriage certificates you'll be disappointed that may not be valid well wow. if your church is not recognized by the state and if your marriage certificate does not have the coat of arms on it it will not be valid and so, also so let, let me, let me, i don't know if if, if if you're happy to answer this but which one which, 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 which of them was is it the court one or the church one all right so yes so to to highlight on this one most churches now before you get married in those churches they will tell you to go to court hmm. and sign the marriage certificate so when you go to the court and you sign the marriage certificate the day of your wedding they will present a certificate to you so when you present that certificate it is valid because one your name is in the register of marriages that you are really married and then a judge has signed your wedding certificate there are many churches that do not have this particular future but i'll mention one church that has this future and that is the catholic church oh, okay. anyone who probably has married in a catholic church that problem is already let's say 80 percent done Okay. Because every marriage done in the Catholic Church has the coat of arms on it, and probably they might have already told you to go to court and sign, mm. and you have published, you have gazetted your marriage and published it for 21 days. Oh, okay. So if you have passed through all these processes, you don't need to worry. But if you are somebody like me who married in a church that the certificates are not recognized by the state, you still need to go to court, sign your marriage certificate, let the judge sign it. Mm. and then it will be published in the gazette then you can go ahead and use that certificate and attach it to your application when you are applying then you can send it so apart from your house address and the, the marriage certificate you also need to attach your police clearance form you need to attach your tv test so you need to attach the photo page of your spouse's passport to your application okay and then you also need to attach the visa page of your spouse's passport. And if possible, if your spouse has already had their biometric residence permit, you need to also attach an image of it. So these three documents, very so, important. Um, the residence permit of, let's say the man, or the person, the spouse yes. in the UK. Exactly. Okay, that's So right. you need to attach, because as of the time your spouse is applying, he or she doesn't have uh, yeah, a resident permit yet. So it's only you, the one who has, you will attach yours and attach the visa page okay. of your passport and the photo page of your passport. Of course, the passport should be valid. And all those date, the documents should be in date. That way, the visa office will be convinced that you have given your permission for your spouse to apply for the visa in your name. Okay. So these are the documents you need to add when you are applying to make the process seamless for you. Let's talk about the dependent visa. You know, every visa has got um, some benefits with it. Like um, looking at our health and care worker visa, we've got one or two stars that we can do and those that we cannot do. So let's say someone has come, your wife has come with a dependent visa. So, I mean, what are some of the benefits and what can she do and what can she do? Yeah. I think there's one thing I needed to mention that I forgot to mention about uh, if, you have, if you have children. I think somebody may ask about if you have children. So if you have children, if you are filling the form, yeah. you need to mention all those children that you are going to be traveling with. 
and those children must be less than 18 years of age and they must be dependent on you as well okay and they must all have their own passports Mm. that will bear the name of you the spouse to indicate that you are related by birth okay so you need to get all these details in uh, children that are above 18 years unfortunately may not be considered for this kind of visas. so i think the the only restriction that is on a spouse who has come on the spousal visa is just that the person cannot engage in sporting activities like any activity relating to sports mm. that is the major restriction that comes with the spousal visa once you get it you can do almost everything apart from sports yeah. you cannot engage in any sporting activity that will earn you revenue apart mm-hmm. from that you can virtually work anywhere at all yeah well, that's good um if i didn't know much about this dependent visa but i think i've go much insight about it now okay so let me mm-hmm. ask this um how long i mean how's the duration of the visa because i know um looking at I mean, I did apply for the health and care recovery visa, and I think it took about, is it one week or two weeks or something like that? And, you know, so with a dependent visa, has it got a specific duration? So, uh, thank you very much for this question. I think uh, uh, when you apply, it takes up to two weeks. Mm. You know, we came during COVID, so during COVID, you know, there were no interviews or not. I don't know whether it has changed, whether there are still interviews or not, but once you have all the requirements, within two weeks you should get a, res- a response okay there's even a tracker there's a tracker for you to do exactly where your documents are and where they have gotten to with with regards to processing of your documents so in terms of duration i, I think there's something i also need to mention uh, the visa the spousal visa is tied directly to the visa of the spouse that is inviting you to come so let's say You've come in with the health and care visa, which is supposed to last, so let's say, three years or let's say four years, and your wife comes with a dependent visa. Does that mean that her visa is also going to expire the very same day your visa expires? Um, it may not be necessarily the same day, but I think within that same period, it will expire. But I think there may be some leeway, maybe uh, do, like... There may be a leeway, say one or two months difference, mm-hmm. but not necessarily the same day, but within that same period. And it depends on the other person. Say, if for one or two reasons your spouse has to leave the country, unfortunately, it may also affect you. Unless you are able to get a job that is prepared to give you a certificate of sponsorship. Mm-hmm. So if let me, let me, let me say, understand this 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 side very well. I think it's very important. So let's say yeah. Apparently, you are here in the UK, you've been able to bring your wife, I mean, your wife is on a dependent visa. And at the point, it's like, okay, um, you're supposed to go back to your country. It's going to affect your wife as well. Exactly. So what I mean is, let me just put it in black and white. What I mean is, if you come here and by mistake something happens and you are going to be deported, mm. it will affect your spouse. Unless they get a job immediately, that is prepared to give them a certificate of sponsorship oh, okay. and that is the only reason why they can stay behind mm. but if they don't have any job that is prepared to give them a certificate of sponsorship like the name of the visa suggests it is a dependence visa and yes or a spousal yeah, visa dependence is gone so you have to fully exactly. Well, I mean, that's a exactly. so oh, okay if the oh. one you are dependent on is gone it means you have to also go as well because first of all you came on the person's income you came on the person's uh, address and so many things, the person's passport and their visa and everything. So once their visa has been revoked, it means automatically yours has also been revoked. Unless you get a job mm. that is prepared to sponsor your stay, that is the only reason why you can stay, even if your partner has to leave. Okay. okay. So my next question is, if someone is on a dependent visa, do they also get their um, BRP? Or it's still directly tied to the spouse's own? Oh, yes. Immediately you come. So what happened is that once you get the visa, they will attach a letter in it. And they will tell you where you prefer to go and pick your BRP. Mm. So your BRP definitely will be ready in the post office. So your spouse will have their independent BRP. 
Because if you are going to apply for a job, you know your NI number. Yeah. Has, that is your national insurance number. It has to be different because if your spouse is going to be working, she has to be paying her own tax. Mm. Different from yours. So she would need her own uh, national insurance number. And one more thing I must add. So I'll talk about tier two visas. So if you have a tier two visa and your spouse is coming, she will also be on a tier two dependent visa. Okay. What that means is that you will not be entitled to public funds. Mm. There are so many things that, let's say if probably your wife delivers, at that moment that you are going to be uh, still having the PRP and not have an indefinite leave to stay, you will not be entitled to child care. Mm. You will not be entitled to many of the benefits that people who are permanent residents or people who are citizens are enjoying. So you will just have a residence permit. And that is it. So let me just ask this question. You know, with our health and care recovery, sir, there is this thing, I don't know if I'm pronouncing health care surcharge, which is an additional fee you pay with the um, yeah. visa so that you can able to access free health care. So, so with your spouse coming in on a dependent visa, is she also entitled to free health care? Let me put it that way. Is she made to pay an additional amount of money together with um, the visa fee so that at the end of the day she can access free health care as we did? Yeah. So I think I don't think uh, she may need to pay. Mm. But the truth is, anybody who is living in the UK is entitled to free treatment under the NHS. But the problem is that it's not every cost that the NHS can bear. It is not every cost that the NHS can bear. There are certain conditions that if you are diagnosed with, mm. it will require that you rely on public funds, say funds or money from the government of the UK to ensure you get the treatment you require. But unfortunately, if you find yourself in such a situation, you may have to pay from your pocket because even the health surcharge will not be able to come in at that point to help you because you'll be treated as an overseas person who is a private patient mm. and not entitled to public funds. The interesting thing is that once you pick your biometric residence permit, it's written boldly at the back that no public funds. Yeah, I, 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 I've seen that. <laughs> I've seen that. Exactly. I've not paid attention exactly. to it. So. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> So we have had the opportunity. There were a few occasions that we had to test some of the laws and it came back blatantly clear that we cannot benefit from anything like public funds because we are not citizens and because we are not permanent residents. Mm. So yeah, no matter what the health surcharge is, just pray to God that you are healthy because it is not every disease that is covered. There are some of them, even the consultation you will pay and all your medication and everything, you will pay for everything. Yes, that comes with it. I think I know, I remember, um, I think one of our colleagues went to visit a GP, and I think she was made to pay a few cents of money for, I mean, so I was asking if there is free um, health care here, um, is it only limited to the NHS, or if you are, I mean, exploring the GPs, you still have to pay, but I think it came up that you have to pay. So let's say there is somebody, I mean, I've had people contact me. I think just this morning, I had a, someone contact me on my LinkedIn page saying that the wife has got sponsorship, COS, coming to the UK to work as a nurse. His question was, would his wife's um, COS cover him? Because you know, if you're not with certificate of sponsorship, you're supposed to have an amount of money in your bank account. I mean, to prove that once you come in, you'll be able to cater for yourself, your accommodation and all those stuff. So he was asking, does he have to get an amount of money in his bank account so that another day he's able to secure a visa or the wife's COS is directly tied to him that he wouldn't have to get any amount of money in his bank account for verification? I don't know if you have any yes. further idea about it. So I think the little I would say is that, you know, unless it is your wife who is applying for the visa for you as a dependent, if you also want to come with your wife, what that means is that you are going to come as an independent person. Oh, wow. Yes, and you need to be able to produce a bank statement to, to show that you have when you come, you will, not be, 
Exactly. Like I said, when you come as a tier two person, you are not going to benefit from public funds. Mm. So the government wants to be sure that you have enough money. That time your wife is not working, you have enough money in her British bank account mm. and to have a British address. So if you apply, you need to show that you have a lot of money in your bank account. That will be able to support you. I think the advice I'll just give to this gentleman is that he should just calm down, take his time, let the wife go first. Mm. And he should just pray for the wife to pass the exams yeah. first of all. And all these things can be sorted out. Even if your wife arrives and has not even written OSCE or even gotten a pin, if you have the capability, you can still let your wife apply for the visa for you, but you will have to look for your own accommodation Mm. And you have to like take care of all the psychological trauma that comes with settling in, even when your wife has not even settled in yet. So if he's so desperate to come, he should just let his wife come in first. When the wife comes in, maybe a month or two, then the wife can let him apply for the spousal visa. Mm. And then he can come and take care of his own accommodation, the feeding and everything. Since probably, I think he's financially stable, that's why. He wants to come in. That's the simple advice I'll give to him. I think he wanted to be sure because if the wife's U.S. is tied to him, then it's like, I mean, it's a free deal for him to come with the wife. So I don't I think, think he's got his certificate. But the thing is that the wife is coming as a nurse. Yeah, he is not a nurse, so his certificate of sponsorship cannot be tied to that of his wife. Mm. Unless in exceptional situations that they will let you come. With probably a charge. Remember when we were coming, one of our police came with a child. Remember? Yeah. That was because the person was a single mother and there was no one else at home to take care of the child. Mm. So that was an exceptional situation. Unless probably the child is a vulnerable child that the child cannot stay, that the child has to come. That way they can bend the rules a bit and give you a leeway. But apart from that, as a fully grown man coming with your wife, unless your wife has a condition or a problem that she cannot travel alone and must be with you. Mm. And even with that, you still need to prove you need to prove that your wife cannot come alone and you need to be there with her. So those are the exceptional circumstances. Apart from that, your wife's US does not cover you and you need to apply independently. Hmm. That's well understood. I'll let him know. And uh, before we wrap up, I would want to ask one last question. So, you know, with our health and care worker visa, we could do our 37.5 hours of shift and then do more than, even more than that as an extra or an overtime. But I think recently it's come up that you are supposed to do 20 hours in addition to our 37.5 hours, so, which means in a week we are doing 57.5 hours. So with your wife on a dependent visa, um, is she also tied to this route? So I think... Uh... I'm not quite sure. No, my okay. wife really works hard. My wife works really hard, honestly. Mm -hmm. And in her one of her jobs she applied, they told her that there was a form. She requested that she wanted to work beyond the, the 40 hours per week. Mm -hmm. So there was a form she needed to fill to, to indicate that she has given her consent for them to give her hours beyond the 40 hours per week. Oh, okay. Apart from that, I don't think there, there are restrictions at all. Once you are able to fill that form and you give your consent, I think you are good to go. I am not aware because one thing is, it depends on the work your spouse is doing. I think those of us who work as nurses, there's a reason why we are not allowed to overwork ourselves for obvious reasons because when you work so much in other areas apart from the place where you have originally been brought to come and work. The stress from that other area may impact on the quality of work you are going to do yeah. in the area that you have your contract with. So that is an obvious reason. So it depends largely on the kind of work your spouse does. Mm. So if your wife does a kind of work that does not require a lot of intellectual input, if it is, let's say, labor work or factory work or any work that is like you know, physical. I think she can work as much as she wants. But of course, too much work is not good for the body. No, because yeah. you don't want to yeah. work and use your money to treat yourself. <laughs> but I think the maximum you should work is about 60 hours per week. And oh, that is okay. a lot. 
That yeah. is too much. Too yeah, much, that's too honestly. much. Honestly. Okay, that's good. Yeah. I, I think we've had a very lengthy conversation. Let me ask one last question. This is just an advice. A question in the form of an advice for people who are eager to come with their spouse. I mean, I think good. Like, they've got sponsorship and it's like, I have to come with my wife, I have to come with my husband at all costs because maybe, I mean, you know, one can't live without the other, those stars. What advice would you give them? Thank you very much for this opportunity. So if you have passed and you have gotten your CUS and you are prepared to come to the UK, congratulations to you. Yeah. But uh, the little advice I will say is that please take your time. There's a time for everything, as the Bible says. As much as you want to come with your spouse, Remember, there is a new country that you are moving into. And the stress of settling in is not something that you can downplay. So take your time and do first things first. Yes, do your spouse a favor. Allow him or her to settle in first. And when they prepare the place for you, let me put it that way. We Christians believe that Jesus Christ has gone to prepare a place <laughs> yeah. for us. So also understand that your spouse has gone to prepare a place for you. It will do you a lot of good. I have a friend who I was staying with in the same house. She's a, she's a female and she was prepared to let her husband and the children come around. She used that particular period to organize schools for the children. Mm. She had to organize for school and make sure the schools were prepared to receive her children even before they got here. Yeah. So by the time they got here, the school was already ready for them. They didn't waste that's, any time at all. They started school right away. No, and number two, really accommodation. You need to get a student accommodation. In the UK, it's not like back home that when you want an accommodation, you just call one agent or you start roaming from house to house and ask you whether they have a room here. <laughs> it has a lot of things you need to do. You need to search online. You need to be able to get references. And as a new employee, they may even ask you to get a guarantor or somebody to be, you know, your sponsor because yeah. they are not quite sure yet. So what that means is that you need to be able to have a lot of money in your bank to get a bank statement that will be able to prove that when you get the rent, you can pay. And that takes time. Yes, most important, the OSCE. The person needs to pass because if the whole family come around the person, you indirectly be putting pressure on the person because your stay in the country will depend on the person. And if the person does not pass, it means you all sadly need to pack and go back home. So you need to rather stay back home and pray for the person to succeed. And then when you finally come over, like most stories always go, you live happy hereafter. So let's just take our time and do the right thing one step at a time. And I know that that great reunion Will happen. I remember the day I saw my wife for a very long time. I was so, so, so happy <laughs> yeah, that finally I can, we met again. I can imagine the feeling. <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. Oh, that's good. Exactly. That's good. That's good. Yes. Okay, so um, you've given us an insightful information. In fact, I had less knowledge about some of these things. That's why I felt like let me just um, tap into your experience. So that another day, if let's say I marry. I would be able to, I mean, I wouldn't have to fumble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much. I believe that um, followers, subscribers, I also enjoyed this lesson. And then I know most questions will come under the comment section and uh, we can take it from there. So, if you are watching this video, I have not yet subscribed to my Impulses channel. I'll leave the link in the description box. Okay. He shares very important content. I mean, you can imagine what he shared with us here. So, just grab his channel and then enjoy more content from there. Um, thank you very much for joining up to this point. I believe that this video has been much more insightful and that you are going to share, you are going to like and then subscribe to our channels. See you in our next video. Bye.